the Allegiance for Young Artists and Writers identifies teenagers across the country with exceptional artistic and liter literary talent and brings their remarkable work to a national audience through the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Ellie's piece named Reflection Contemplation was awarded a National Silver Medal while Liam's piece, Drum Major, was awarded a National Gold Medal. Let's give these students, um, and in addition to the one who couldn't be here, a round of applause for their outstanding achievement. Congratulations. All right, now this one um, is it's pretty outstanding. Um, you know, academic excellence has been a cornerstone of Blue Valley's foundation for more than 50 years and is characterized by students achieving at unprecedented levels. In December, we celebrated 20 juniors throughout the district who scored a perfect 36 on the ACT. Yeah, pretty amazing. Today we celebrate and add eight more to that list who tested in December, February, or March. If you're here tonight, um, as we know a lot of them are very busy and had activities, but if you're here tonight, would you please come forward? Any of our perfect ACTs? And Tanya, if you wouldn't mind handing them the mic, I'd like for them to introduce themselves. I wasn't sure who was gonna be able to make it. We'd like to know who you are. I'm Gianna. And what school do you go to? Blue Valley High. Um, I'm Rebecca, and I'm from Blue Valley West. Congratulations. That is absolutely amazing. We're going to take a picture first. And we have another student who has also earned a perfect ACT, and I would like for her to come forward. Tell us your name and where you're from. Hi, um, I'm Lisa. I go to West. We're going to take a picture, and we are so proud of you. An absolutely amazing, outstanding achievement that very few students achieve. <laughs> so our next recognition, um, Aiden Shaw, would you please come forward? Participation in high school activities and athletics is a valuable part of the overall high school experience. Tonight, it is an honor to recognize one student athlete in the district who performed at such a high level this past season. He was awarded for it. Would Aiden Shaw, um, let's please give him a round for a round of applause for his achievement, which he's from Blue Valley High School, and he was named the 22 Darena Award winner. Congratulations. <laughs> Now a little bit more about that award. It's presented to the most outstanding high school basketball player in the greater Kansas City area. And he becomes just the third Blue Valley student athlete in the award's history to be presented this honor. The last Blue Valley student athlete to win the award um, was Christian Braun in 2019, and now college basketball national champion. So congratulations, Aiden, on this absolutely amazing accomplishment. I know your family is here with you tonight. Would you please stand and be recognized? because we know it takes a lot of support from the home. All right, thank you very much and congratulations on your achievement. <laughs> All right, so we have two more uh, recognitions we wanna do this evening. It's also an honor to recognize two staff members with the Distinguished Service and Excellence in Education Awards. These people go above and beyond each day in our schools and across the district. Would Kyle um, Rungi please come forward? <laughs> Kyle is the System Analyst for Information Technology Services, and Mike Gott is his supervisor. So we're excited to recognize Kyle with a Distinguished Service Award. Kyle has been with the district for five years, and he's a familiar face at these board meetings because he's always making sure 
um, that the technical part of running a board meeting goes smoothly. So all the streaming that you see happens so that you can watch it from home and also the things that go on here from the mics. So absolutely incredible. But I know that's not the only reason he's up here today. Mike, what else would you like to say about Kyle? Uh, when Kyle joined the team, he already possessed uh, an extensive knowledge and a very strong skill set. Uh, he's done nothing but uh, enhance both of those since he's been here. Um, he's made a number of uh, extraordinary contributions to the team and to Blue Valley in general. Uh, he was instrumental in the uh, upgrades that you've seen in the boardroom over the last couple of years. And um, it's a pleasure to see him uh, recognized for uh, his contributions. And uh, I'm incredibly uh, pleased and, and proud to have him as part of our team. And Kyle, is there anything you want to say? Uh, no. no. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I couldn't let you be up here without saying something because uh, you have personally helped me uh, when I'm in a jam. I know the board members, uh, you have helped them with their technology. And the thing that really strikes me about you is you always say yes. You never say, I'm too busy, I can't help you. Uh, you always say yes, and you're willing to help. Uh, you are the, the tech person on our campus here at DO, and, and I know my colleagues over here would join me in saying uh, thank you for um, all that you do to, to support us and make sure that we can do our work. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> I know you might have family here. Do you have family here? Oh, yeah. Oh, please stand. We're so proud of him. Thank you, and congratulations. Now back to work. <laughs> All right, now it's time for our Excellence in Education Award. Would Taylor um, McBee please come forward with your principal, Melissa Hansen. We are excited to recognize Taylor McBee, special education teacher at Overland Trail Elementary with the Excellence in Education Award. This school year is her second in the district. So Melissa, tell us why Taylor is so special. Well, we think Taylor is very special. She is finishing her first year as a special education teacher at Overland Trail Elementary. She shows up to work each day with a smile on her face and ready to tackle whatever the day might bring. Um, she is optimistic, she is resilient, and she is eager to make sure that each student has their best day. Um, because she invests in developing trusted relationships with her students, um, the results in her classroom are just amazing. Um, Taylor, we are so proud of your ambition and the commitment you make to the students and staff at OTE. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. And Taylor, uh, you have some family here, right? Yes, I do. Oh, you that winners. way. Um, I have my mom, my dad, and my boyfriend, and I have some school family here too. So, Aww. Yes. Well. We want to thank your school family and your family uh, for sharing you with us. And um, it, you know, you work with some of our uh, students who who need the most help. And um, we can't thank you enough for all that you're doing to support them and make sure that they have awesome um, school experiences. Thank you. All right, congratulations. Did you get the picture? Yeah, we're good. Okay, we're good. Thank you. All right, and that brings us to a close. Um, Blue Valley is um, known for having the very best educators and staff around, and it was an honor to highlight a few of our best. I just want to make sure, did anybody come later that maybe wasn't here before um, that got missed and wasn't recognized? Because I know we had a few. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we had the opportunity to recognize them if they showed up late. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. We have uh, students that visit as part of a class, so that's... Are you Rockhurst kids? Get a wave? 
I think so. So they'll be in after recognitions. <laughs> and we usually have to sign off to make sure they stayed for the whole meeting. <laughs> but anyway, if you were not here for the regular Board of Education meeting, now would be a good time for you to leave. You're welcome to find a better seat. If you're here and want to stay for the whole thing, that's great too. But now's the break. And then we'll begin the regular Board of Education meeting here in just a minute. Okay, we're going to uh, start the open forum. Um, welcome to those who are in attendance to address the board and listen during open forum. Open forum provides a time for individuals to address the board in an effort to ensure an orderly, efficient, effective, and dignified meeting. Open forum will be provided for up to 60 minutes. In an effort to give as many individuals an opportunity to speak as possible during the 60 minute open forum, the board will enforce the three minute uh, uh, per uh, speaker. After 60 minutes, the board will close open forum and proceed with its agenda items for the evening. Whether you plan to speak or just listen, we are glad you're here because we care about the opinions and concerns of our patrons. If you do not have an opportunity to address the board during the meeting, you may address the board by email communication. I have a few reminders about open forum that will help our speakers to have a constructive and positive experience when discussing items with the board. When making remarks, please be civil and use respectful language. Uh, Please limit the discussion to the relevant business of the board tonight. Discussion of matters related to a specific student or employee are not allowed. Instead, comments should be submitted in writing to the superintendent. Please remember to limit your comments to three minutes and avoid repeating concerns of a previous speaker. If you have any questions that require response, someone will follow up with you at a later time. On behalf of the board, I welcome you and appreciate your interest in Blue Valley as we strive to provide the very best education possible to our students. When your name is called, introduce yourself before beginning your remarks. As a reminder, I ask that all remarks are limited to three minutes, and please no interruptions, and let's get started. Um, Edwin Janier? Okay, Melissa. Yes, are we on? All right. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Melissa Jenner, um, and I'm a mom of three, soon to be four, uh, here in the Blue Valley School District. Our preschooler just got screened in, and he's going to be peer next year, so we're very excited about that. Um, I'm here just as a mom today. Um, I've spoken here before um, as a physician. Um, and so I always have to say that these are my own thoughts um, and not the thoughts of any organization, but I'm just here as a mom and a patron of Blue Valley today. I've not attended uh, a meeting in a few months, um, but as I watched the last school board meeting, I was really struck by how angry a small group of parents were about a few books. So I was already quite familiar with the books in question. Um, and I started to think, 
Why are some people so afraid of our children being exposed to diversity in thought? I personally want my kids to ask questions and to read from a variety of authors, even authors whom I don't agree with personally, because diversity in thought leads our children to ask questions. Asking questions leads to robust and engaging conversations and opportunities for learning. And in learning, our children have the opportunity to become the person they were truly meant to be, not the person I wanted them to be, not the person that someone, um, not the child that is someone who does something because of what we demand of them, but children who are fostering learning and discussion for the next generation. That's why I'm here today and I'm thankful for the five board members uh, who also value diversity in thought, families, and cultures. When we listen to others, even those we don't disagree with, we have the opportunity to learn and grow. So thank you uh, to the five of you for letting our children have that opportunity too. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Corinne Gessler? Lisa McMahon? I'm here to speak about the hypocrisy Five board members stripped the VP of his title and are trying to get him recalled because he personally doesn't conform to their views. Let's elaborate on the board's views from what I've witnessed thus far. You're grooming. You're pushing child pornography in the schools. The same five voted to keep gender queer and fun home in our libraries in violation of policy 4600. No wonder we have students publishing articles in school newspapers on hooking up. You promote hatred in the schools by choosing books like The Hate You Give, which is anti-white, anti-cop, and Poet X, which is anti-religion, to be discussed in English. Now you want the children to reject their own bodies. You have a diversity council, but allow no diversity of thought. Here's an excerpt from a speech that a student gave at a high school diversity assembly to the whole student body, at the very least as a violation of board policy 4535.2. I want to fight for my people. No, not for this country. I pledge no allegiance to a flag that's blue that symbols tears, red that's dripping with blood for whites like the white robes of the 1860s, white knights of the 1970s, and white knight Nazis of the 2020s. Ain't it funny how the same colors that are supposed to represent freedom are the ones flashed in your rearview mirror like a warning of about what is to be taken away? I want to fight for my people, which means I will never leave this country to go kill other brown people for a country that abuses black people every day. He ended his speech with his fist in the air, declaring he wants to be a revolutionary. Bravo, well done. You've turned out the hate you give personified. I know his viewpoints are aimed at conservatives from the names we've been called here. It's obvious that this young man hasn't been taught the truth, so I would like to rebut. The white robes of the 1860s, the Republican Party led by Abe Lincoln was founded to stop slavery. No Republicans were ever owned a slave. Despite opposition from the other party, Republicans championed the 14th, 15th, 19th Amendments, as well as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the National Voting Rights Act of 1965, calling for the equal treatment of black people, including the right to vote. There was 39 Republicans, not, uh, eight Democrats. The White Knights of the 1970s, the KKK was the militant arm of the Democratic Party, much like BLM and Antifa today. The White Nazis of the 2020s, a Nazi is the person that wants totalitarianism and demands conformance. You know, the people that deny free speech and push for mandates. Conservatives are the exact opposite. It calls for limited government, putting the power in the hands of the people. What I would like to say to him, I know you believe you're being a revolutionary. I get that. It's only because they've deceived you. You aren't going against the grain. You are the grain. Look up free thinkers like Candace Owens. She'll tell you all about it. And look into the origins of Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood. Be um, a revolutionary for the most oppressed, the unborn. For the left says they don't even exist, even though we have clear images they do, and they call us the science deniers. Thank you, Lisa. Next speaker is Jeffrey Nessel. Uh, 
Jeff Nessel and my son will graduate in about one week, <laughs> hopefully. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. I've used that Al Pacino line from Godfather 3 on numerous occasions to why I'm again dressing this board. And then I wondered, who are they? Who am I referring to? Well, they include a member of this board who tried to use his fellow board members as a shield for his homophobic and transphobic hateful remarks. But thankfully, five of you didn't provide him cover and in fact stripped him of a title. And when he, asked to defend, when he was asked to defend the indefensible, he had the gall to play the victim card and use a passage from The Crucible for his reasoning. The Crucible? A play that is an allegory about McCarthyism in the 1950s in which lives were destroyed by unfounded and baseless accusations? A thought lost on other members of my they, the peanut gallery that showed up on Thursday, cheering the misuse of Arthur Miller's work and showing their complete lack of understanding both of the play and of irony as they shouted vile and disgusting untruths at members of this board with no basis whatsoever in fact. Why? I don't know. What I do know is I did something I have never done at a public meeting, which is tell someone, will you please just shut up? As they continue to shout vulgar epitaphs at a member trying to speak. Not proud of that, but I want to hear what Jody had to say. <laughs> but the, th the they I really want to talk about are the students, especially those with special needs, who perhaps won't get the same opportunities my son did. Opportunities which in the last few months have led to him getting almost a 4.0 GPA, being elected by his peers, to prom king and absolutely killing it on stage at the last ability showcase. I think some of you can verify that. Um, this is the, the same child I used to pick up from elementary school who stood alone, barely spoke, and had no friends. How did he flourish? Obviously, it starts with him. My wife and I will take some credit. But he also had incredible teachers and administrators trained to work with children like my son. Now with the state legislature cutting funding for special needs, a squid game for money is pitting parent against parent as districts and priorities are being redrawn and the kids are the losers. This is happening for a variety of reasons, but at least the board was always there to fight for the kids and be a voice of sanity. But that's not the case anymore because you have been pulled into some ridiculous battles on the backs of 22,000 students that are, in my opinion, being used as a ladder for political gain and a personal agenda by those who don't give a crap about these kids with their only concern being how they can leverage their bigoted beliefs for higher office. It has nothing to do with helping children. It takes away from the board as they are forced to deal with the minutia of these quote unquote moral dilemmas. It's not right and it needs to stop. Thank you, Jeff. Emily Uretsky. There we go. Okay. Hi, my name is Emily Uretsky, and I'm here to talk about special ed. I have two kids in the district. My ninth grader has an IEP for dyslexia. My daughter's dyslexia and learning challenges have been long, stressful, and fraught with tears. But I'm here tonight to tell you that her experience at Blue Valley North has been absolutely outstanding. Her success is the product of her outstanding teachers, specifically her special education resource teacher. I'd name her, but I know we're not supposed to use names. While I'm eternally grateful to a perpetually, oh, I'm sorry, well, I'm per eternally grateful, I'm perpetually worried about our district's ability to attract and retain these quality teachers. What happens when they continue to turn over and leave the district? I worry about the huge caseload our special education teachers have to take on. Will that drive them away from the profession? Additionally, I worry about the number of paraprofessionals who won't return next year. Currently, they are stretched covering different classrooms and subjects during just one high school period. This can't be good for students learning. It's clear the legislature will not fully fund the state's special education needs, and each district will be left to cover the shortfall. I implore you to cover these costs and add even more teachers and paras to the special ed program. Not only will this keep teachers and paras in the district as their caseload lightens, it will attract, grad it will attract graduates from education school as they funnel into the pipeline of qualified teachers. I also wanted to thank the five board members who took action last week at this special meeting. 
I'll remind you that you can still publicly censure this board member. I'm wearing a shirt today that says, why be racist, sexist, homophobic, or transphobic when you can simply be quiet. It's sage advice. And I'm so sorry for what the audience put you through last week. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, the next speaker is Wendy, Wendy Conley. Hi, my name is Wendy Connolly, and I have two kids in the Blue Valley schools, and one of them actually is here with me tonight. He wanted to tag along. Uh, I just wanted to say I was at that last meeting, and I recognized what was going on in the audience, the insults that were hurled at you guys, um, the vile names, the things that you were called. I'm really sorry that that happened. It's so unacceptable. And I just want to thank the five members of the board who stood up for my kid and for so many other LGBTQ kids in our community and said, you belong here in, Bu in Blue Valley. And mostly I'm here tonight to fill a seat uh, and to show some of the decorum and dignity that sadly was missing at the last meeting so that you all can get on with business tonight. So I want to thank you, Amy. I want to thank you, Gina. I want to thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Jody. And thank you, Tom. And also, Dr. Merrigan, thank you so much for making an effort this week to show up um, at the GSA clubs. I know the kids really appreciated that. So thank you all, and all means all. Thank you, Wendy. Riley Long is our next speaker. Hello, my name is Riley Long and I am a teacher at Lee Wood Middle School. I am a product of Blue Valley graduating from Blue Valley Northwest in 2007. Growing up in Blue Valley was a great experience, but it was a bubble. I had teachers who supported me and a great foundation to set me up for success later in life. After high school, I completed my bachelor's degree at KU and am currently working on my master's at Pitt State. When I was in high school, I started noticing that I was different from my friends. I never felt like I fit in and lacked confidence in myself. I couldn't exactly identify what made me different, but it made me feel at a loss and isolated. Later in life, I came out as gay and now identify as transgender. Coming out as trans was the first time I ever felt like my life made sense. Luckily, my family was supportive and I have been able to continuously succeed. Since coming out as trans, I've met a lot of people who don't understand. I've been bullied and called names for being who I am. The lack of education and willingness to get to know trans people leads people to fear. This fear should not dictate a school district. We need clear policies created so that trans students and staff in this district are protected. Ignoring us and not including us in these policies is even worse than bullying. For two years, I have worked at Leewood and been afraid of letting people know who I am. I work with amazing people, but I know that not everyone may understand me. I desperately want to be my authentic self, but the opinions of others and the lack of support from the district makes me worry about exposing my true identity. Being trans isn't something you learn from a curriculum or a book. It's how you were born. Your gender ideology is a fake narrative used to justify discrimination. Keep telling yourself you're helping kids when all you're doing is hurting them. In 2020, the Trevor Project reported that 52% of transgender and non-binary youth considered suicide. Who can blame them when political activists are writing policies against them and we aren't even allowed to say the word gay in schools? Is, is it going to take a student committing suicide for this district to change. For those of you who don't understand, I challenge you to get to know a trans person. Grab a cup of coffee, speak with a parent of a transgender student. Open your heart and protect these students. We will be trans with or without your support. Be the one to make change and support all students in Blue Valley and leave the bullies and hate behind. Thank you. Thank you, Riley. 
Sahar Parmar is the next. Sorry about that. How do you pronounce it, please? Uh, hello, uh, I'm Sahaj Parmar. Um, I'm a student at Blue Valley North High School in Overland Park, Kansas. Uh, over these past months, I've become increasingly concerned with the board's departure from issues that affect the material conditions of Kansans into an inane culture world politics. Uh, this brings me to the conservative campaign against critical race theory. Uh, as a high school student who's taken AP classes on European and American history, I can with full confidence say that high-level legal theory is not part of the course curriculum. The word has been so overused, it's become a dog whistle for any institution or instruction on race in the classroom. Crit critical race theory is not a blanket term to be used with instruction on America's sordid history of racism and discrimination. CRT is a cross-disciplinary intellectual and social movement of civil rights scholars and activists who seek to examine the intersection of race, society, and law in the United States. You most certainly would not re receive instructions on CRT if you were a high school student. Additionally, the past few years have been extremely difficult for our teachers who have had to juggle students online or in person to receiving harassment from their own community. One of my favorite teachers actually left this year due to the harassment she had faced. However, I can proudly say that our teachers have been at the forefront of the pandemic and have worked tirelessly to ensure that we receive the best possible education despite all the challenges. Me being here delivering this speech is all the proof you should need. So I must say it's extremely disappointing to see that our board is being so callous with policy that would directly affect their lives. We should be focused on attracting and retaining teachers, and unfortunately the MO seems to be the exact opposite. Spreading vitriol and hatred not only to those who have worked during the hardest during the pandemic, but to minority groups as well. This brings me to my last point, which is the sudden surge of legislation, not just in this board, but around the country, targeting LGBTQ plus youth. From the Don't Say Gay Bill to the Kansas Senate recently passing a ban to transgender women from competing, it's disgusting and morally reprehensible that LGBTQ plus rights are under attack once again in our state and in our board. Continuously introducing anti-LGBTQ bills and pushing homophobic rhetoric will lead to bullying in schools and decline in the well-being of LGBTQ youth. LGBTQ youth, and especially trans youth, have a high suicide rate because of the legislation and rhetoric pushed by this board. This ostracization of our queer youth is abhorrent and will only lead to more of them committing suicide, and it's on us as allies to protect them, but more importantly, it's on the people in power, the people in the Senate, and also the people on this board to protect LGBTQ youth. Thank you. Thank you, Sage. Sloan Heller. Ephraim Taylor. Hello, my name is Ephraim Taylor, and it is not often that I come up here to thank the board, but um, after the last board meeting, I would like to thank the five of you um, for taking a stand against transphobia and racism. Um, recently, we've seen a lot of people complain about censorship, yet try to ban books, mainly from black or people of color or LGBTQ people. Um, regardless of whether you guys try to ban these books, your children are still gonna be gay. They're still gonna be trans, and that's Okay, you say that trans ideology is harmful, and I could tell you all of the medical and psychological institutions that say that that's completely false, but you don't care, because it's not really about being right to you. You really just want to be a bigot. <laughs> At the last board meeting, we won, and we will continue to win these fights. And um, off the cuff, I'm glad that um, some people really liked my speech. <laughs> this new generation is revolutionary. Everything that you fear will happen. We will be proud to be black, we will be proud to be gay, we will be proud to be trans, we will continue to fight for our right to choose. At our schools where we lead walkouts, on the streets there will be protests, we are revolutionary. And our school, our state, our country, our world will change, whether you like it or not. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ephraim. Griffin Connolly. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Griffin Connolly, and I am a student at Blue Valley Schools. I just want to say thank you for choosing students over bigots. Thank you, Griffin. Rupal Gupata. Bill McMahon. Um, Bill McMahon has prepared a statement, but he's unable to be here for health reasons. So, someone read someone else's statement earlier, didn't they? The first speaker? You can email it to us. Okay, but we can't allow the disabled to speak? I, I didn't believe, I, I mean, the point is, is was he signing up to speak or was he? He was, but he had a health issue this weekend issue. and was in the hospital. So he gave me his statement. Just let her read it. There's people with COVID who aren't here who are on the list who are at home. As, as, long as, as long as it's a statement, it should be fine. Then she can read it. Yeah, it's then. a statement. So you need to be signed up and you need to be here. Otherwise, you can email it to us. Okay. If Thank that's you. your decision, I'll have him email it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sheila Alberts. Jenny Cox. Justin Weaver. It's making a mistake. Irina Weaver. It was a mistake. Okay. I would like to comment on some statements made last um, during the last meeting. First one was how divided our community is, and the second was that uh, this board promised to eliminate distractions and focus on education. So. First, this community was divided by race. In May 2020, parents received an email from Blue Valley South District expressed its support for, of BL, for BLM without waiting for more facts to emerge. Then we were divided by public-private schools, school affiliations. You started to push for eliminating tax credits and vouchers for private schools. That's who is your competition. Later, you divided our kids by mask, no mask wearing. The school board mandated mask for younger students, which was a total violation of their constitutional rights. Recently, you voted for keeping sexually explicit books at our school libraries, that libraries new division edit. Uh, Dan Cohen from Channel 41 and Sarah Reeder from the Kansas City Star have, have divided us, uh, our community, even further with these one-sided hit pieces from April 20th and 21st, suggesting that if people disagree with you, that means they hate you. Rita wrote, uh, McMillan's st uh, statements directly target and isolate valued members of our community. Her opinion divided us. Cohen suggested that we have a hateful climate in Blue Valley. Such outrageous thought divided us. Another quote from the article by Sarah Ritten, Ritter. Uh, at the Blue Valley School Board meeting, a longtime teacher said that schools are facing a crisis. It's not how race is taught in schools or what library books are on the shelves. It is ongoing teacher shortage. Well, I would add, Rita forgot to mention that teacher also said it's not even about COVID. However, I would like to uh, add some facts to reflect on. Here's the news newspaper's headline, Lockdowns, Lockdown drove 60,000 children in the UK to clinical depression. GMA network investigation findings. The prevalence, and I quote, the prevalence of depression and anxiety symptoms during COVID-19 have doubled compared with pre-pandemic estimates. And moderator analysis revealed that prevalence rates were higher when collected later in the pandemic in older adolescents and in girls. I hope that some of the current board members remember how many parents ask you to let students back to school in 2020, including the parents who lost their child to suicide. However, you did not budge. Yet recently you acted swiftly to the petition for removal of Jim McMullen, so you stripped him of the VP, VP title. That is why we don't trust you, and that is one of the reasons why we are divided. President of the American Federation of
Thank you. Um, Lisa, if you would like your husband's uh, statement read at the June meeting, we can, you can present it and we can have our reader read it, if you'd like. Okay. Um, Jenny Cox. My friend's daughter was a sophomore at Blue Valley West in 2018. One day, my friend noticed cuts on her daughter's legs through the rips in her jeans. Later that night, my friend and her husband asked their daughter to put on shorts. After waiting 20 minutes for her daughter to come out of the bathroom, my friend saw cuts all down her legs and all down her daughter's legs and arms. My friend broke down. Although her daughter couldn't say exactly why she was cutting, she confessed it had been going on for a while. Her daughter desperately wanted and was willing to get help. She enrolled in an intensive outpatient treatment center. During this time at school, they were and still are weaving social emotional learning state standards in school subjects. SEL in summary is an educational method that claims to foster so social and emotional skills within social curricula. However, some staff use this to relentlessly focus on feelings. Your feelings depend on you, but not what happens to you, uh, not on you, but on what happens to you and, was it, and what is happening out in the world. This locus of external control became so strong for my friend's daughter to handle. If that is how feelings work, then what can I do to change my life? What is the point? Her daughter began turning away from church where she was raised. She began questioning everything. And my friend knows that teens in high school are often self-discovering normal behavior. However, in, during this time, one of the things her daughter was questioning was her sexual attraction. My friend's daughter became dependent on her best friend, another girl. This girl was also having mental health issues. Her friendship became more, and they started dating. My friend knew this was not who her daughter really was. School counselors wanted to affirm her daughter. My friend knew the focus needed to be on anxiety and depression issues. She knew that these two girls were experiencing codependency. They also were not mentally well enough to be in a relationship. The daughter gave my friend a lot of pushback, had a lot of resentment toward her, but my friend persisted. She loved her daughter so much, and that didn't change when her daughter had this relationship. About six months, after about six months, her daughter and her friend had a falling out. My friend's daughter healed from depression, started dating boys, and still does. She no longer identifies as gay, and most importantly, she does not blame her mom for affirming or fostering the time in her life when she had a relationship with a girl. More and more schools are affirming the children's feeling as fact. Soon, as soon as a teenager has a feeling, we must validate and affirm them. If you feel this way, you must be this way. There's no room for cognitive growth of the brain. What they, think about big, what they think about big ideas here in the world can greatly change from month to month, vacillating between mature and immature thought. Often teens having these feelings are going through anxiety, depression, and other mental illnesses, other mental health issues. These need to be addressed first. My friend wanted her story to be shared so that parents going through the situation can have hope for their children. We don't need our schools affirming, fostering, encouraging, and in some cases manipulating these ideas. Parents can find alternative ways. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Julie Catt. Hi, my name is Julie Catt. I'm becoming increasingly concerned with the rapid spread of hate in our school system. It seems that differences among people are being used as the reason for hate. However, a person who disagrees with someone or the way they choose to live does not mean they hate them. There are, several, there are civil ways to disagree and still respect. Why can't we all just agree that we do not agree on all topics, but we can be kind to each other anyway? What makes this country so great is that we are also different with different ancestry. We all have immigrants in our families that brought them here with different cultures and beliefs. We are still considered the melting pot, and I know personally many people who have risked their lives to flee to America. I have friends and acquaintances from many countries with many different beliefs and upbringings, very diverse in every way. I appreciate them all. The one thing they all say to me is that they left their countries because they did not have our particular freedoms. We can't force other people to think exactly alike, and I'm sure that isn't what any one of us truly want, but it seems like it's happening right in our schools. I have two children in their 20s, one of them active duty military, and they both graduated from Olathe schools. When my children were in grade school in Nebraska, I was active in PTA, which is Parent Teachers Association, as well as the citywide PTA. The one thing I remember most is that parents, teachers, and educators work together for the good of the kids. Even when disagreeing on personal viewpoints, 
there was still respect and admiration for individuality. No one was forcing their views on others or taking theirs away. But somehow, this seems to have changed. There are students who are allowed to openly verbalize their hatred for this country when there are other countries that would enjoy our freedoms and not take them for granted. These students also openly verbalize their hatred toward their own school and toward their own classmates. Not only is this hatred infectious, but it has been proven to lead to other things, such as depression, suicide, bullying, and even sadly, school shootings. There is a claim to stop hate in BV, but even on their petitions, they speak words of extreme hatred. We all need to come together to spread kindness. Here's a few of my favorite quotes for everyone. Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. That's by Mother Teresa. Words are truly the image of the soul. And the Dalai Lama says, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy to a friend. That's by Martin Luther King Jr., as well as a few others. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. I have decided to stick to love. Hate is too great of a burden to bear. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Next speaker is Jason Anderson. Next speaker is Brooke Liu. You guys ready? <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Brooke Liu. Um, I have three kids in the district, and I have spoke at several board meetings as a mom and a healthcare provider. I want to thank the board members for letting me speak tonight. First of all, I would like to address the new math curriculum that has been presented. I'm not sure what role SEL has to do with math. I have seen sample problems. Now this is from a school district in Missouri, Lincoln County, R-3, um, where it says x equals y minus 1, y equals negative 4x plus 21. Trying to support her son as a single mother, she worked as a pimp, prostitute, and A, parentheses, negative three, da, or comma, negative two, bookie, B, parentheses, nine, comma, 10, drug dealer, or C, parentheses, four, comma, five, nightclub dancer. Now, I'm not saying that Blue Valley will see any of these problems, but I hope not because they're not appropriate, um, I believe. Um, like I don't want, you know, I wouldn't want my parent or my children seeing these kind of math problems. Um, the second point, uh, over the past two years, we have seen a lot of division in our school district. That's been very apparent as of this evening. Um, it's, you know, became apparent over the masks, the vaccines, the curriculum, keeping explicit porn pornographic books on the shelves. Um, it's been apparent that two, there are two completely different viewpoints amongst the parents, the teachers, the school board members, and the administrators. And in the end, all we want is what is best for our children. Um, but we as parents have the rights to know what is going on in the schools, whether it's the curriculum, to social activities, to sports. And we must be able to bridge the division amongst the Blue Valley community. So therefore, my third point is, is I think Katie Bowers will do just that. She will provide by the Blue Valley rules and policies while bridging together the Blue Valley school board members, the administrators, and the Blue Valley community as a whole. I nominate Katie Bowers to be the vice president of the Blue Valley board for the current term. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Brooke. That wraps up our open forum for tonight. On behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to thank our participants. We appreciate that each of you took the time to share your thoughts with us. Please know that the board and the district administration took notes during the open forum and will follow up as needed with participants. Uh, so we're gonna take a five minute break for our closed captioner.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'd appreciate it if you would uh, take your seats. Oh, those guys are. I just okay. guessed that. We, we thought they were students from Rockhurst. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to resume our meeting. Um, we've got some guests here from uh, Leadership Overland Park. Appreciate you coming tonight. Um, we're going to call the meeting to order. We're going to uh, receive uh, reports from board advisory committees. We will start with health and well-being um, with Dr. Schmidt. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure they're not going to broadcast this. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm positive. Um, the Health and Wellbeing Board Advisory Committee met on April 6th. Um, during this meeting, we brought in a health services uh, uh, group that talked about how the school nurses serve our students and our staff. Um, during this time, we, we talked about the varying roles that nurses have. It's not just Band-Aids. Uh, and it's not just COVID. We're also serving a lot of kids with significant health needs that would not be able to be at school if not for the presence of a school nurse. In fact, they, they identified 870 students with severe health conditions uh, that they serve in addition to 9,000 students with known health conditions and all the rest that just have things that come up during the day, as you all know, as parents. Um, following this uh, discussion and also a question and answer period for the panel, uh, we moved on to talking about ideas for improving the committee. We talked about adding some more student voices to the group. So we're going to have two representatives from each high school uh, going forward. And then we spent the rest of the time brainstorming what topics that the committee wanted to explore for next school year. The meeting uh, concluded at 535, and our next one is September 14th, 2022, next year. Thank you very much. Uh, curriculum and instruction from Dr. Collier. The Curriculum and Instruction Board Advisory Committee met on April 13th. Jennifer Lezinski greeted the committee and reviewed the agenda for the evening. Uh, that evening, Christy Rottinghouse, our K-12 Literacy Coordinator, and Colleen Zink, our Dys District Dyslexia Coordinator, shared a presentation on the new elementary resources for teaching using the structured literacy approach. During their presentation, Christy and Colleen led the committee through examples of learning activities our students engage in for each of the four areas of structured literacy. Additionally, that evening, Jennifer Lezinski provided the committee an overview of the cycle of curriculum writing and revision in Blue Valley and the timeline for the process this past school year. Well, it's almost to pass school year, a couple more days. She explained that sharing the documents with the committee is part of the process for gathering feedback on the drafts prior to you as a Board of Education approving those documents. The feedback was due back from committee members by May 1st uh, prior to uh, presentation of that material to you this evening. The next meeting is this week, May 11th, via Zoom. Uh, student activities, uh, Kyle Hayden. The Student Activities Committee met on April 14th for the final time this school year. The purpose of this meeting included an update on mental health first aid for coaches and sponsors, potential topics for next year, and the recognition of their seniors. Matt Ortman shared information he received from students involving the need for mental health support. He further advised that funding was secured and training is scheduled for getting all coaches and sponsors in middle and high school trained. High school and middle school administrators provided activity and athletic updates along with the Blue Valley Rec. Yes, the Finance and Operations <clears throat> Board Advisory Committee, excuse me, met on May 5th. 
The meeting began with a general district update from myself, Patrick Curley, and Amy Teisling. Jeremy McFadden, Director of Finance and Bond Advisor Dave Arterberry, reviewed the results of the sale of the Series 2022A competitive bonds. Dr. Mark Schmidt, Assistant Superintendent of Special Education, and Jeremy McFadden presented on Blue Valley Special Education Program and shared the budget expenditures dedicated to meeting the program requirements. Director of Business Operations Jason Gillum presented the bids and contracts. The next Finance and Operations Advisory Committee meeting is scheduled for June 9th. And that concludes our committee reports. The next item on the agenda are received reports from board members and superintendent. Uh, Amy? I do not have anything today, okay. but thank you. Thank you, Amy. Gina? I don't have anything either. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gina. Jim? No, I don't have anything. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Tom? Blow through some good news real quick. So uh, we're about to graduate close to 2,000 seniors, 1,800, probably 1,800 to 2,000 here in a couple weeks. So excited about that. Um, a great time of the year. Um, we had a record for national merit semifinalists. Was it 56? 54. 54 national merit semifinalists. And then obviously I well beyond what I thought. We had a total of 28 perfect ACTs. That's going to be close to a, a Blue Valley record. Um, saw that Blue Valley High won, won, finished third at state speech, state champs in oration and poetry. If you didn't get a chance to watch Will Jones run the 400 meter dash last Friday night at Shawnee Mission North Relays, the fastest time in Kansas history, second fastest time nationally this year at 46.2. It's spectacular to watch. Um, I saw that we have an eighth grade, first time ever, an all district track meet. So that includes all the eighth graders, the boys and girls, and I think it's a great thing because uh, all them competing against each other. And good luck to all our teams coming up in all the leagues and regionals and states and, uh, and those type of things. And then also wrapped up a lot of school plays and musicals that I know a lot of board members are at as we traded notes. You were at all of them, I think, Jody. So um, that's all I got, all good news. Thank you, Tom. Jody? Um, yeah, so um, I, I do want to do a shout out to um, the CAPS network um, that you know, uh, we kind of st we started here in Blue Valley and it's now spun off into some really great things um, and giving um, some really great options um, across the country. But, but they just reached uh, 80 new affiliates and Tom and I are part of that um, um, committee board. Um, and so that's really exciting for them. And, and they're just taking off. There, there's so much opportunity there to, to serve students and giving students options out there. So it's really exciting to, to see that growth. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Topeka, was that last week or the week before? I can't even remember. Um, and network with other um, school boards and superintendents and administrators um, and just hear about great things going on throughout the state of Kansas and um, share what we're doing, the great things that we're doing here. So that's, that's always been a lot of fun. I was also able to um, network a little bit with, uh, with uh, my legislator and uh, I always enjoy my, my, my discussions with uh, with him, so um, I want to give a shout out to the Ability Showcase. Went to was that last week, Mark? Is that right? Um, it was absolutely fantastic. Um, the um, the the amazing talent and and um, skill set that our students have. Um, I, I was I was absolutely blown away. It was it was wonderful, and I saw Patrick there, and I saw Gina there, so um, that was really exciting. And a uh, huge shout out to um, Night of Lights, Blue Valley Foundation's big uh, shindig. Um, it was packed. Uh, I volunteered at a table, and it was absolutely packed with people. And it's so nice to see community events in in Southern Johnson County. Uh, we don't we don't necessarily see a lot of that, so it was really exciting to uh, to see it, watch adults and and kiddos enjoying themselves, and and just to be a part of that. So I think that's all I have. Thank you, Jody. Katie. Yes. Hello. Um, so I first off just wanted to thank um, Dr. Collier, Dr. Schmidt, and Kyle, and actually that entire section of people over there. Um, it has been a very, very busy past couple months um, with hiring as well. Um, just all of the work you do, I don't think the general public realizes how hard you guys work and how many hours you guys are putting in. So thank you, because I know that our district runs better because of you guys. So um, I did attend the health and well-being meeting, and I wanted to share something 
really cool that I don't think anybody knows that our nurses can do. So they actually um, can monitor a student's insulin from an iPad. And if they detect that they need a dose of insulin, they can walk up near them, like, and the student may not even know. And they can walk up near them with the iPad and tell their little um, machine to give them insulin. And the student can just go about their day, continue learning. Um, there's no learning loss. They're not having to run back and forth um, just to check levels all the time. So I thought that was pretty amazing that we have that kind of technology and nurses that are you know, well-versed in um, diabetic care. So, And then lastly, we just attended the retiree reception, which was very neat. It was you know, bittersweet because they're leaving, but pretty sweet to get them all together and thank them. And um, I just want to thank everyone who set that up. That was uh, very cool. Nice food classy music. So good to see everybody. That's it. Thank you, Katie. Dr. Merrigan? Um, yeah, so for my updates, usually I just have it written down on a piece of paper and I quickly am trying to go through it. So I'm going to do something a little bit more formal. Um, so I have this little presentation. It, it, I promise I'll go quick. Uh, and it will live in board docs so people can go back and, and look at it. Um, but I'm going to share some really positive things that have happened. Oops. Maybe. It does not seem to be working, so you can just advance it for me. Um, go ahead. Uh, first one is uh, three Blue Valley s seniors were named semifinalists for a U.S. Presidential Scholar Award. Uh, this is a big deal. They select uh, two students from each state for that. And so we had several students who were in the first round, and now we have three who are semifinalists, and we'll find out in, uh, before graduation if they made that. Go ahead. Um, Blue Valley North student, Scarlett Jones, uh, tonight is having her work performed at the Coterie Theater. How cool is that, um, that, that she is doing that? Next one. Um, I don't know if you saw this on the news, but this high school contemporary a cappella group uh, won a national or an international award. And many of the students, not all of them, but many of them on there are Blue Valley students. And so we want to congratulate them. We think that was pretty cool. Um, Pleasant Ridge Middle School is the Regional Science Bowl champions. You're going to see a theme here. Go ahead to the next one. Pleasant Ridge Middle School is also the Science Olympia uh, team that won the state championship. Um, and their uh, nationals will be held virtually in just a few days. And so we're uh, sending them good luck. Uh, we saw Aiden Shaw today. Um, so he was here. And he is the uh, Darina Award winner. Uh, Blue Valley High Schools were named the top 10 uh, high schools in Kansas. All five of them made that list. This is a, a Newsweek list that goes out, and they look at a number of different factors. And honestly, that's not just our high schools that should be celebrating that. That is all of our schools, because that doesn't just happen when they magically walk in in ninth grade. That's our elementary, our middle, and our high schools. Um, the next one, uh, 54 Blue Valley seniors were named National Merit. That's a district record uh, for us finalists. Uh, last week was uh, National Educator Appreciation Week. So we have 1,888 certified staff members. And 73% of them have a master's degree or higher. So almost three-fourths of our staff have um, advanced degrees. So we want to shout out to our educators. Um, some more uh, CAPS students, uh, CAPS Innovate students, um, Tyler and Jackson placed first in a high school uh, division and were selected best of show in the KC Invention Convention. Um, another CAP student, a bioscience student, uh, was selected as the 2022 Kansas Stockholm Junior Water Prize winner. And I got a chance to talk to her. Wow, she, she's got a bright future. Um, that was pretty exciting. Um, we have, so this Wednesday is School Nurse Appreciation Day. And we have 40 nurses, so uh, Katie you know, gave a shout out to our nurses and what they do. But we have 40 nurses, and those are RNs in our district. So every one of our schools has at least a nurse. And then we also have 13 nurse paraeducators who support some of our students with special needs. Um, here's two Blue Valley High students. This just happened, I think, this weekend. Um, we're um, Keisha 6A State Speech and Drama Champions, uh, Blue Valley West. Um, Rishab, maybe, and Mahika 
uh, in poetry. And then this is what Tom was referring to just a minute ago. So Will Jones recorded the fastest time in the 400 in Kansas state history this past Friday. And um, the time is 46.29. And it's the second fastest time in the country. So that's impressive, <laughs> very impressive. And then um, we had BPA, Business Professionals of America. Um, we had a national leadership conference. These are students who uh, made it to nationals. And so there you have a host of students uh, from our different high schools. And that's it. So um, just some, some really exciting, good things happening within the district. Uh, and we just wanted to showcase those. Thank you, Dr. Merrigan. I appreciate all my colleagues uh, going through some of the things that are going on. Uh, I've been to several of them. The My Abilities Showcase was really an outstanding show of all the kids' artwork and their uh, performances. Um, and so um, just to name a few, but uh, ultimately uh, graduation is coming up, and uh, we look forward to that and, and certainly celebrating that with uh, our seniors and their families over the next couple of weeks. And, um, Ultimately, uh, hopefully, uh, every child had a very successful school year, and we want to encourage that going forward. We appreciate all our parents' support uh, and support from the communities and commitment to the district and the kids. Um, you know, please reach out to your teachers and thank them for their efforts this year, uh, and our administrators, uh, obviously, our staff over there on the side there, they make sure everything goes well and the, and the information is presented effectively and efficiently, and so I want to thank each and every one of them for what they've done over the last school year. And I know things have been um, interesting at times, but uh, they hang in there and sometimes the meetings are long, but uh, everybody's done an outstanding job and, and appreciate everything you do uh, for the district, uh, despite some of the sacrifices for your families and spending nights here. Um, all in all, we appreciate uh, everybody uh, here in the audience tonight and, and making their comments and, and uh, providing a civil uh, environment uh, for um, presenting your views to the board. Uh, now we're gonna proceed with the board's um, um, meeting. And so, uh, you know, approve the agenda for the May 9th regular Board of Education meeting is published. Do I have a motion? Patrick, I would just like to uh, address one item as a possible change to the agenda. Um, item D, uh, elect Board of Education Vice President. So. Um, just with the conversation that has occurred, I would say in the last couple months with the new board members in particular about the timing of, of leadership elections um, and the fact that as a new board member um, coming on board, getting sworn in and then having to choose uh, board leadership that the timing is not great. And so as opposed to this item being an action tonight, I would like to propose a change so that item D is informational only, um, and that would give us a chance to talk about that uh, before make, moving forward with um, an action. Is that a motion? I can certainly make it a motion. It would have to be a motion. Okay. Um, so I move that the Board of Education amend the published agenda for the May 9th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting in the following way. Uh, change new business item D to informational only and add an, oh, only, yes. Is there uh, a second? And just from workshop this morning, there was some conversation about adding um, an item as well related to the Board of Education Communications Committee mm -hmm. um, and adding that as an actionable business item just because we felt like we were at a point now that we could go ahead and approve that committee so I could certainly expand my motion to include both items. So are you going to expand your motion? I can. Would you like me to reread it, or can I just stick an and at the end? Um, why don't you reread it, please? Okay. I move that the Board of Education amend the published agenda for the May 9th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting in the following way. Change new business item D to informational only and add an actionable new business item E, approval of Board of Education Commi Communications Committee. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there discussion from anybody? 
I have a question. Okay. So I thought that we added it to the agenda because board policy stated that we had to vote on it. Didn't Melissa advise us of that? Well, there's a board, board policy that um, states that um, essentially at the next um, regular board meeting, um, a vacancy should be filled in one in either of the offices. So, so don't. So, so don't there we, is a policy that um, would would suggest that we need to do that tonight. Okay. And I, I did talk to Melissa just from a legalities perspective, and she felt like if we wanted to press pause on that and just have this conversation um, and possibly address it, that she felt like we were going to be okay. Um, but that was her take on it, just because I had the same question as well, that could we, could we do that? Any other discussion on the motion? Jim? Um. I'm not, I'm not in favor of amending the agenda as it relates to the vice president position. I would just prefer to move forward with, with that. I'm okay in adding, you know, an actionable new business item for approval of a board of education's communications committee. Uh, any other comments? I mean, I think the motion includes both at the moment, but, yeah. um, okay. Any other comments? Policy states reg resignation from vice president, right? Yeah, specifically, there is, it does use the word resignation, but it um, would contemplate basically a vacancy. The spirit of it would be focused on filling a vacancy. Anybody else have any other comments? Um, I, I would just comment that uh, I think, Patrick, you and I have even discussed that you've reviewed the duties of the vice president and that um, I think just practically we will be okay for uh, long enough to at least have this discussion i mean i mean the duties are basically to uh step in when the president's unavailable um you know i per, you know personally i think uh f you know i think the board should go ahead and fill the uh the vacancy as provided by the policy i think the point amy was making back in january the conversation was t a couple of our new board members said you know, we just came on the board. We don't know everybody, correct? We just started, which is true. We talked about it a little bit today. I think we used to nominate president and vice president in July. We switched to January per a Kansas statute that we had to do that, right? That statute no longer, it, it's, still, it's still there. It's still there. It's still there, but it allowed you to, um, you just have to have a policy in place that says you're going to do it in January, or excuse me, in July. Okay, so we, 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 you would we need could, to change that. We would adjust our policy to do it in July, to go back the way we used to do it in July, get board members the time to know each Correct. other, figure out who the best leadership group would be. I'm just piggybacking on some conversation we had in January when we were going through this a little bit. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any other comments? I'm just thinking about the future for the July thing. So. Sure. Um, any other comments? Seeing no comments. All in favor of... Um, Amy's motion moving to amend the agenda. Raise your right hand. I think this is just a motion to add, to change the agenda item. We don't have to do a second, um, second motion to actually amend the agenda. So, 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 to a, so to change, so to change, so all in favor of changing the published agenda, or the um, changing the Board of Education to amend the published agenda for May 9th on the regular Board of Education meeting in the following way change new business item D to information only and add an action item new business item E approval to the Board of Communications Committee. All those in favor of that motion, raise your right hand. All opposed? Uh, three in favor, four opposed, motion fails. Um, do I have a motion to approve the agenda for the May 9th Regular Board of Education meeting is published. I move that the Board of Education uh, Board of Education approve the amended agenda for the May 9th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting. It'd have to be the original one. So, just that we lost the Board of Education uh, Communications Committee as part of that, so we would have to go through that process to get that added as well. Correct. So do I have a motion to 
approve the agenda for the May 9th Board of Education meeting as published. So what, you you gotta, you gotta amend something first if you wanna add the communications piece to it. Okay. Um, how, about I just, how about I just state a, me, uh, a motion? I move that the Board of Education amend the published agenda for the May 9th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting in the following way. Add an actionable new business item, E, approval of a BOE communications committee. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the Board of Education Communications Committee? Well, just to reiterate, we talked about exactly what that means earlier at workshop. And so what what we're looking at is is um, creating a, a board advisory committee similar to our CNI and and all of our other committees that we have that that bring together community patrons, students, and and um, staff um, in in with a focus on communication um, and kind of looking at where we can do better, potentially. Um, Christy, is there anything you want to like, um, kind of well, we're gonna talk fill in the gaps that. on that? Yeah. We're, okay. so we're just saying it I'm would just, become an agenda item. I, yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to do that so people understand why this is important to us. It was important to all of us, I think, this morning, so. Any other comments on the motion to amend the agenda to add an actionable new business item e approval of board of education communications committee seeing none all in favor raise your uh all in favor raise your right hand all uh, opposed raise your right hand any abstentions did you did you vote jim okay so motion passes 7-0 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. That was your for the agenda, right? Yeah. I move that the Board of Education approve the amended agenda for the May 9th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting. Is there a second? Second. Um, motion by Tom, second by Jim. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to amend the May 9th uh, regular Board of Education agenda meeting to add an actionable new business item of e-approval of the Board of Education's committee raise your right hand. All in favor raise your right hand. All opposed? Any, are you opposing, Amy? No, no. Okay. That was just a lingering hand, sorry. Um, motion passes uh, 7-0. Okay, now we have the consent agenda. Um, is there anybody who would like to have anything removed from the consent agenda? Um, we had some discussion this morning on purchasing memo, which I had opportunity to, to talk with Patrick, and I think I understand the process by which a lot of those expenditures get, get um, you know, discussed and vetted through the finance committee. Um, so I, I think I'm, a, you know, I don't have any concerns about most of those. I, I would like to pull the panorama expenditure and have a separate discussion and a separate vote on that. Okay, so we're gonna pull off. It's contracts. Okay, so we're going to pull off the panorama contract and move that to new business um, item will be now F. F. <coughs> okay, do I have a...
We have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda for the May 9th regular Board of Education meeting as modified. Yeah. motion? Yeah. Okay. Motion by Jim. Is there a second? Uh, second by Katie. Any discussion on the consent items before we vote? Okay. Um, all in favor, uh, raise your right hand to approve the consent agenda. All opposed, motion passes 7-0. Okay, we're on to new business. We have the Drug and Alcohol Committee update, please. Uh, Kelly Ott and Emily Demo are making their way up. Uh, Kelly, here's the clicker, but I don't know if it'll work for you. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I have with me today Emily Demo. She is our district coordinator of student support services. She has a lot of things in our district, and one of the thing, one of her main duties is to uh, write and manage and work with um, folks across our district and our community around our drug and alcohol um, grant from the ATF. So I'm going to let her speak. Actually, I'm going to let you say that, and I'll be here. Hi. Good evening. Well, maybe having the same issue um, so the alcohol tax fund grant um, we are funded yearly um, we apply for the grant yearly and and thus far we have received the grant yearly we being obviously the Blue Valley School District so this grant is through the Kansas Drug and Alcoholism Council of Johnson County um, and which is a program of the United Community Services of Johnson County um, so this grant helps our um, drug and alcohol committee um, which again is funded by the alcohol um, tax fund grant to use Kansas communities that care data to really dig into what our students are reporting and use that data to plan for the needs of students and families within our school district. Um, so really without that funding, um, our district wouldn't be able to as easily make intentional programming choices and decisions um, based on that yearly Kansas community that, communities that care data. Um, so our primary purpose in our drug and alcohol prevention work that we do within all of our schools um, is really for prevention and education for our students, but also to intervene and support students um, when they may be at risk or when there's an infraction that happens within the school setting um, that revolves around drugs, alcohol, um, vaping, something of that sort. Um, so again, the funds from the ATF grant allow us to um, support students fifth through 12th grade across the district um, and expose them to different prevention, education, and early intervention um, resources and curriculum. Um, so overall, the grant supports many things, um, but our Blue Valley Drug and Alcohol Committee, um, we meet five, a minimum of five times yearly, and that committee is made up of um, representatives from all of our middle schools, all of our high schools, and our Blue Valley Academy. Um, and myself. Um, and so the, the grant funds the stipends for that staff, um, for those staff members who participate on that committee. Um, and staff members who are a part of that committee um, to receive their stipend, they do extra work outside of their school day. So they research, they read articles, they watch movies, um, they read books. We typically do a book study every year um, related to drug and alcohol um, information so they're well informed so we know what's going on um, you know in the community going on across the country to help best support our students um, that grant also funds assessment vouchers for students who again may have an infraction within the school setting related to drugs and alcohol or um, who a member of the school team or a family may be concerned that there's some substance use happening um, so those drug and alcohol vouchers are um, paid for out of the ATF grant um, they cost $150 per drug and alcohol assessment and that um, is no cost to families who receive that assessment so we um, contract with either um, clinical assessment Associates, um, First Call, or Johnson County Mental Health um, Adolescent Center for Treatment to receive those 
um, or for students to go and receive those assessments. Um, and then additionally, the grant pays for our district's subscription to a program called Signs of Suicide, um, which we use sixth through 12th grade, and it supports um, prevention of suicide um, within our schools, and it's just a consistent um, program that our students are familiar with. And um, we're able to use this grant because there is a connection between substance use and suicide risk. Um, and then just wanted to talk for a second about our um, spring event that we just had, and both Jody and Patrick um, were in attendance at the event, so thanks again for coming to that. Um, we had an event, um, our Drug and Alcohol Committee, um, as a part of the grant, we, are necess we have to do a yearly event. So um, our spring event this year was on April 13th. Um, and our primary speaker was Libby Davis, who is a Johnson County parent whose son um, died of an accidental overdose of fentanyl um, in August. And so she spoke to um, the group of individuals who attended our um, event really about the increasing um, trends of fentanyl use within our Johnson County community, the greater Kansas City community, and nationwide. Um, and it's timely that I'm speaking of this tonight because actually tomorrow on May 10th is um, National Fentanyl Awareness Day. Um, so just, I think that's an important thing to highlight because again, and Libby highlighted this in her, um, in her um, communication to us during this event that um, really, this, this is an increasing um, need and concern within our Johnson County community. Um, so after Libby spoke, we had a panel of individuals speak. Um, Libby was on the panel. We had an emergency room physician from Children's Mercy. Um, we had a representative from First Call, who again, we use for our drug and alcohol assessment vouchers, as well as our substance use sobriety groups within all of our high schools. Um, Kids TLC, Johnson County Mental Health Adolescent Center for Treatment, um, and then a representative from our school district as well. And we just spoke and um, had an opportunity for um, staff or for anybody in the audience to ask questions and um, hopefully get some good information and resources to take back to their own families. And then um, just to have that information, um, again, specifically related to fentanyl, but substance use in general, and what those trends look like for adolescents currently. Thank you. I would say we're very thankful for the grant as it um, gives us uh, additional funds and also connects us with partners in the community to help with drug and alcohol prevention. So if you have any questions, we'll happily entertain them. Jody, you got questions? Well, I was just um, gonna say, I think you know Patrick and I, after we attended the event, um, we were just so struck by um, the exponential rise in fentanyl poisoning and deaths over the last even year. Um, I, I, I used to you know, work in the corrections field and, and there were certain you know, hot drugs you know, at the time and that was a number of years ago. Um, this, is, this is a big deal. Um, this, is, this is the first time use could kill you. And so I know our conversations were about you know, this is this is putting out a warning uh, to our, our parents and our kids um, that this is going to affect our community drastically. And and you know, we're trying. I, I appreciate you guys coming here because we're trying to sound this warning now um, before it's too late. Absolutely. So, sorry. Yeah, I, I want to thank Emily for the presentation. It was really good. I mean, fentanyl. I I think one of the slides, if I remember right, is seventy six percent of overdose, de overdose dose deaths in Kansas are uh, from fentanyl. And so um, that's pretty extraordinary and, and it's such a small amount. Um, certainly fentanyl, there's a lot of other drugs that we're having to deal with, I'm sure, in our schools. I'm sure vaping is a big issue. But in terms of the committee, what are the, what are the resources that are available for parents that, that um, if they run into one of these situations, What's, what's the best thing for them to do, um, not only the first time they find out, but ongoing? Sure, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I would suggest that they do is talk with one of their school mental health professionals. So um, school counselors, school psychologists, school social workers, and those individuals can help have a conversation with the family and help guide them towards resources that we have in our community. We're really lucky in our community that we have Johnson County Mental Health Adolescent Center for Treatment. Um, again, we can recommend that students go in and get a, a free assessment through them, but families can also 
choose to do that on their own. Um, First Call was another really great, um, it's, a, it's a nonprofit um, organization within our community, um, and so families can contact them. And First Call, they can help kind of talk through and do sort of an assessment um, and help families, okay, so maybe they can't provide some resources or support for the family's specific situation, but they can give some um, suggestions to whom else may be able to do that in the community. Um, so I think those are kind of three really kind of high level good resources that families can start it can be really overwhelming. Certainly maybe their medical provider as well. Um, but you know, school, we have, they have access to their school providers every single day. So that's, a, that's an easy, you know, have a conversation with those people and we can help get them um, connected to any community resources that they might need. Okay, anybody else, Jody? It's just me again. Um, so um, just, just to kind of reiterate what this Mill Valley mom um, told us is that, you know, her son, it was a group of four friends. Her son was one of them. They split the pill. They thought, I don't know, it was Xanax or something. Percocet. Percocet, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and uh, they, they split the pills in half. So her son and the friends all ingested half of a, a very small pill, and they all were hospitalized. Her son didn't make it. It's so toxic, and it's, you know, this is, this is, people are manufacturing this. There's no way, you know, there's no regulation knowing how much you're getting. Um, the other thing is vaping. You can get this through the vaping, uh, you know, devices also. So um, what you thought maybe was, was not as toxic, some parents maybe thought that, that, that it can be in there. So it, this is a big deal. And, and Kevin Kufelt, who's the, the clinical director of um, Johnson County Mental Health Adolescent, or ACT, um, he shared that um, in the, before eight months ago, the most common reason that, that kids were seeking treatment at ACT was for marijuana use. Um, and then in, in the past eight months when they pulled that data, it's actually fentanyl um, is the primary drug of use. And so, I think that's just an important fact to highlight that he just shared at a meeting I was at recently with him, um, just because those are those are students that are you know in our community. Those are Johnson County students that they're supporting, um, and so you know to Jody's point with the the in, the intensity of you know maybe someone's purposely taking this, maybe they're not. It's just important to know that um, it's a significant thing that is occurring within our community for our students. So I'm I'm, I'm sure that, that your presentation that the event went into to detail. I'm just wondering um, for, for parents whether you're seeing age use drop in the, in the last year, meaning you know younger kids accessing this, and two, whether you're seeing a, a marked difference between uh, boys and girls and, and, and the usage there. Um, just speaking to the data that Libby shared and that Kevin has shared, um, yes, the, the, the a first onset of use of, is definitely decreasing. Um, it's decreased over time, and, and recently it's about 11. Um, so that's that's significant. Um, and in terms of boys versus girls, I, I haven't seen any data to, to represent that. But so so if I'm just interested in finding out more about the committee, mm -hmm. when does it meet? I don't not if I want to be on the committee, but if I just want to watch or learn or it's a staff meeting? Yeah, it, okay. yes, yes, it's a staff meeting, yes. So it's comprised of um, various school mental health professionals okay. um, who meet um, throughout the school year during the school day. Um, but certainly, you know, I would be happy to talk to you about the committee. And, and each school has a representative, each middle school and high school. Um, and then we, ho we host the community events as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. Okay, the next item is the literacy update. So Jennifer Luzinski, our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, is uh, making her way and will be giving the literacy update tonight, which is one of the five things that the board charged us with working on a couple of months ago. Thank you, Jennifer. Good evening. I'm happy to be here to, as we near the last few weeks of the school year, to give you an update on the work we've done in the area of literacy this year. So I'll, I'll hit on some highlights. Um, and my um, presentation tonight is organized in the, the, the big components of a K-12 
literacy plan, the key work we would do. And I'll highlight the work we've done in terms of how it pertains to some of the policies of the state of Kansas, which stem from the state task force on dyslexia, but certainly influence our um, literacy work with students K through 12. So this first policy um, uh, is under the umbrella of professional learning. And this is one that by August 31st of this school year, all districts were required to provide specific training to teachers in the area of literacy, of, excuse me, dyslexia, um, identifying students who are at risk, uh, and ways that we would intervene to support all students. So is this working or you're, you're doing it? Okay, next slide please, that's awesome. So I will highlight for you um, just some of the professional learning that we held uh, this year for staff. And I want to start out by um, appreciating that our district administrators, our building principals, felt very strongly when they saw this policy that said that we need to have some educators in certain licensure areas participate in this six hours of professional learning. And our building leaders said, no, we need every certified teacher to participate in this. And so we did half of that last spring, and then we finished that with our uh, staff this August. And so we were able to, to get everybody across that six hour uh, line of professional learning at, at a minimum, uh, and then certainly have offered uh, much more to other educators in Blue Valley. So highlighting a few things, we've worked with our um, secondary ELA teachers twice this year, November 1st and March 21st, and then we were out at buildings working with small groups of teachers to teach them about universal screening. And then we were able to recoup a professional learning day that was uh, canceled with elementary teachers this March, and we enjoyed having many of our elementary teachers with us this summer to learn about some new resources they had for instruction. So. Um, another professional learning opportunity I want to highlight is LETTERS, and LETTERS stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling, so now you know why we just call it LETTERS. Um, this is a, um, a robust, deep, highly regarded professional learning opportunity that thanks to a partnership with the State Department of Education, we are able to provide to uh, teachers in grades kindergarten through third teachers of students who are English language learners, reading specialists, instructional coaches, and special education teachers who work with um, students uh, of age in kindergarten through third grade. This is an optional opportunity that we've been able to make available to teachers this year. And the reason it is an optional opportunity is this is a really deep and thorough professional learning. It is a two-year commitment for a participant to be a part of this. And letters uh, tells teachers up front, you should, pre you should be prepared that you will spend over two years, 100 hours on the learning of this course. There is reading, uh, there are um, trainings that teachers attend, there are quizzes, there are tests. Uh, I'm participating in the first cohort and I would say it is very comparable to, to a college course, but the quality is outstanding. It is very well aligned to structured literacy. It is based on the science of reading. And we hear extremely positive feedback from those who have jumped on board and are in our first two cohorts. So uh, we're very excited about offering that training to our staff. Uh, a couple more notes about professional learning. Um, thanks to uh, some of our uh, literacy team that we have here within Blue Valley, you heard mention, I think, of Dr. Collier earlier of Colleen Zink, Christy Roddinghouse. Um, in addition, we partner with Stacy Cates, a dyslexia consultant. And then I want to recognize Abigail Crane, who um, is, uh, works as um, our 612 literacy team. Because of them, we've been able to really get with some specific interventionist groups, K through 12, to do some very tailored training. So Colleen Zink has done a lot of work with teachers in structured literacy, the multi-sensory approach, uh, resource teachers, reading specialists. She partners with, with teachers and teams one-on-one -on -one as they need some support. Um, and then certainly ha uh, she and Stacy and Christy have trained teachers on how to give universal screeners, and they have um, worked very closely with some of our resource teacher and speech and language pathologists. 
in addition our district continues to provide training in the wilson reading system at all levels for our resource teachers so moving on let's take a look at what the state says about our our screening of students for risk of reading difficulties including dyslexia so every school district accredited in the state of kansas is required to screen students at the elementary level next slide please we actually were ahead of the curve there our system identified that need and was ready to implement that screener and so we fully implemented it in the 2021 school year although we had piloted it two years prior and then had given it to all of our kindergarten and first grade students in the 1920 school year but we were interrupted in the spring so the key to a universal screener what separates it from other assessments is it is meant to be very brief easy to train people to administer and easy to administer and it is not an assessment that will do a deep dive diagnostic on a student. Um, I think of it as that uh, toothpick we put in the cake to see if it's done yet, or maybe that, that just very general physical we would go to annually. Uh, it's meant to alert us that there could be cause for concern, or nope, that cake's not quite done. And so once we have done that universal screener, then we have identified at the district, we have di diagnostic assessments that help us to take a deeper look if necessary. And we are um, also have progress monitoring assessments we can use to measure the effectiveness of supports that we're giving to students. Um, at, at the elementary level, uh, with the reading specialists, we have uh, really worked hard on analyzing assessment data and working with our teachers to uh, use that data for very specific interventions. At the secondary level, we implemented the universal screener this year. And it's important to note that part of the state policy says that students in grades six through 12 will be screened if a nationally normed measure of reading comprehension. So at middle school, think of the map if that uh, assessment shows that that student is not at grade level reading comprehension. So reading comprehension is really the successful outcome of skilled reading. So at uh, sixth grade and above, if a student is uh, demonstrating grade level comprehension on an assessment such as the map, then for that window, that student is, is done with assessment and we'll look at them again uh, two other times that year. At high school, because we don't give the MAP assessment, uh, at high school we use a, um, uh, it's the reading inventory from Houghton Mifflin that we use, it's a nationally normed measure, to look at our high school kids. Um, in year one of implementation at middle school and high school, we needed to do a lot of upfront uh, professional learning with those teams. We started with what's the purpose of a screening assessment? This is really a new type of assessment for um, our secondary teachers. We went out and worked with teams on how to administer and then what, what do I do with the data? How do I, what is it telling me and what do I do with it? And that really is our growth area for continued professional learning for next year. Taking a look at curriculum and instruction, this is the official go year that the state has deemed that structured literacy is the approach for the teaching of reading in Kansas. We had been um, uh, leading and participating in professional learning for teachers for several years, ramping up to this, but this is really the year for implementation. And at the elementary level, um, the, the real work, and I think some of you have been out and seen teachers, you can do the next slide, please, um, in our new um, instructional resources from the 95% group. And this is really the, the resources teachers are using for the teaching of phonics and word recognition, spelling, uh, morphology, a lot of the pieces that are necessary for skilled reading. And I want to give a shout out to our elementary teachers because this was a heavy lift. This is not the way these educators were trained to teach as undergraduates, and this really required them to implement a new approach, which means strategically abandoning some practices that were pretty deep in muscle memory, and then implementing this new resource um, in a way that is, uh, shows a lot of fidelity to structured literacy. So it's very multisensory, it's very explicit, it is very systematic. 
But we, um, again, we recognize those teachers and we're hearing and seeing some really positive gains uh, for students already this year. Uh, we are especially um, pleased with this resource I want to mention at elementary because it gives us an alignment. What a student would get in classroom instruction is uh, very aligned to what they might get if they work with a reading specialist and even if they receive specially designed instruction through special education. So for those students, that means that the terminology is aligned. It means that the, the gestures that they would use, it, the visuals they would use, all align. And so they can have this seamlessness of learning experience throughout their day, which is very supportive of lasting learning. So at the secondary level, 6 through 12, um, our focus in uh, our in instruction with this group of educators next year is really taking that analysis of the screening data and looking at it and, and understanding what is, what, am I, what is this telling me that this student needs and how will I, in my core instruction, provide what that student needs to further their own learning. Many times, uh, by the time a student is in middle school or high school, they are very proficient in word recognition. They've got the basics of, of phonics down pretty well. And so the work at secondary really looks like, for many of our students, uh, a deep work in vocabulary, deep work in morphology, building background knowledge, uh, semantics and syntax that will help them to keep that steady growth in their skills as a reader moving forward. So if we look at reading intervention, um, we can see that it is um, one of the policies that we use structured literacy to have the data and the instructional techniques to, to, to intervene with students early, uh, especially if they're exhibiting reading difficulties such as dyslexia. And that is such an important goal. We always want to provide that early intervention for students as soon as possible. And so at the elementary level, um, this is where we're really working to meld together the data we get from the universal screening plus the data we get from our new instructional resource to help teachers to uh, make very timely decisions and deliver supports or just boosts of instruction to students right within the core classroom. And then reading specialists certainly can provide additional interventions for students when the data would indicate we need more intensity. We will continue throughout the year next year to work on professional learning for those teachers and when, when data says this, what, what's the right move to make? But we want to celebrate that um, even uh, from the beginning of the year to winter, we see using our universal screener, a cadence data, that um, in many instances we're seeing gains for our students. And I, 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 these are not the only gains, but I highlighted a few of the different ones for you. So for example, in first grade in the fall, this is district data, our first graders were, um, WWR stands for whole words read, we're at about 68% um, were at or above benchmark. And you can see in the winter, so December, January, that moved up 10% to 78% of students reaching or, or uh, being well above the benchmark for that window. If we look at the green boxes, that's our fourth graders. And that ORF stands for oral reading fluency. And so in the fall, 76% of our fourth graders were at or above the, what the benchmark would be for oral reading fluency. So that is fluent, accurate reading within a particular period of time. And you can see at, in the winter that grew from 76% at benchmark to 86% at benchmark or above. So certainly we celebrate the growth, but that means those students who were not at level have hopped up and are now on track to, to meet future benchmarks. So we look forward to bringing much more data of this sort. Um, this is, uh, again, that fall to winter window is a little bit narrow, um, but certainly we um, work hard to analyze the subtests to understand what needs to be added, what needs to be tweaked in instruction so that we can meet the needs and, and help all readers to grow forward. At the secondary level, um, we have the established reading strategies course, uh, both middle and high school, for students who are in need of additional literacy learning. We can work with students um, on particular areas of need within the resources that we have. 
Um, and we continue to work with our educators on professional learning that will really help us dial into that solid core instruction and meeting the needs of individual students as readers and writers and speakers and listeners in, in classroom instruction. So next year we'll continue to work with them through professional learning um, around um, implementing their screening data to drive results for students. So that's a quick update, relatively quick, but I'm happy to entertain questions. Uh, can, can you address just what um, aspect in terms of middle and, and um, middle school and high school mm -hmm. in terms of grammar instruction? Is that part of the... So in the, uh, when we look at structured literacy, grammar instruction would fall most heavily under the syntax strand. Um, th that's where that would take place. Is that the, the, it, oh, I wonder whether that's yes. fell under, fell under <laughs> When you were saying syntax and morphology, <laughs> whether it fell <laughs> under, under those or whether that <laughs> was something outside of yep. what you're doing. It, it falls in there. Yeah. Okay, so then um, also always, um, because areas of concern in the past for me um, have been the, um, the volume of reading and writing mm -hmm. that's done at, at both the middle and high school level, and then also the depth or the, the difficulty. Like I look at our ninth and 10th grade reading you know, books, and half of them, I think, have no business being in ninth and 10th grade, they could be moved down to like sixth and seventh grade. And um, so I'm, I'm just meaning there's not enough advanced reading mm -hmm. and enough volume of, of advanced reading and not enough volume of advanced, uh, of just long, long form writing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how you guys are thinking about that. Because mm -hmm. I, I know it's part of what you've been Working sure. on. Sure, absolutely. So step one, I think, was really important for us this year, and that is doing that reading inventory on every student. And what we gain from that is a student's Lexile score. And so we can dig into that Lexile score. So if I look at my class roster, third hour of this group of students, I now can see the, the span of, of where these students are, and I can start to work with students to, to really match them or encourage them or assign them works with following board policy, of course, but that are going to be commensurate with their current reading level to, to challenge them and encourage them to develop. So that, that is really one, I think, first step that came from administering that reading inventory because it gave us the opportunity to, to dial in a little deeper and look at students. So, so prior course grade, you might see a B, and well, that's great, that student was successful, but this gets a little more specific at that individual student level, because to your point, we are looking for students from start of ninth grade year to end of ninth grade year to grow um, in Lexile as readers. I just wanna reiterate what uh, Jennifer said about our teachers. Um, and our, our district leadership team who put this all together, this has been a mountain of work by everybody. And our teachers have embraced it, um, even during this hard year. Um, they knew it was best for kids and they embraced it. So um, shout out to Jennifer and Kelly and, and your team from district office for, for setting this up, um, but also to our teachers for uh, doing the hard work during a especially hard year because they knew it was what was best for kids. Okay, legislative update. Um, legis Sorry, legislative update. I'll just sit here since the clicker doesn't work anyway. Um, so this is just a brief, brief update. Go ahead. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, this was the calendar for the legislative um, in Topeka. Uh, they had their first veto session April 25th through the 29th, and I say veto session number one because they save some days to go back if they need to. Um, go ahead. As a reminder, here are the board adopted priorities, fund special education at the statutory amount, apply at-risk funding, enhance student mental health, and eliminate tax credits and vouchers. 
Um, so I'm just going to highlight just a couple of bills. The first one, the budget bill and CCR is conference committee report for House Bill 2567, because remember the House and the Senate had differing bills. Um, so in this, this is the school budget bill. Um, they funded the BSAPP as base state aid per pupil. Um, as outlined earlier, that's what they're supposed to do. Um, they did not add any additional funding to special education. Remember, we had asked for that. Uh, they did put some money into um, uh, to make up for the property tax exemption at homes from uh, twenty to forty thousand. So that that was helpful to us. Go ahead. And we're still on the same budget bill. Uh, they did fund a state dys dyslexia coordinator from the state general fund, SGF is state general fund, uh, before they were going to have a dyslexia coordinator, but schools were going to be assessed for that. So the state is going to fund that. Um, safe and secure schools grant funding um, to remain at $5 million. Um, they had an online math program. Uh, will be paid for out of uh, state funds. Um, this is for schools uh, who have students who are not successfully being successful in math. And, and so they had had um, a couple of different programs in there. And they had originally said we were going to pay for it, but the state is going to pay for that. Um, and then $13 million was added. Um, removing the federal uh, impact aid from the local foundation aid calculation. And then this was the policy part. They delayed the open enrollment start date to the 24-25 school year. So that open enrollment, remember, is that um, students or boards of education would set policies, and we would um, be required to at, utilize those policies to take in students from outside of our boundaries if we had room. Um, go back real quick. This is a waiting action by the governor, unless she signed it today, because I haven't seen the news or done anything all day um, online. But that is a waiting action by the governor. Uh, the second bill, it was a sub for Senate Bill 34, um, prohibited state and local officials from mandating masks and other public health measures aimed at mitigating the spread of infectious and contagious diseases. Uh, that also had something in there about um, vaccines, I believe. And that is also awaiting action by the governor. And then um, finally, this is just one. Uh, we've talked about this one before. So this was the conference committee report for Senate Bill 58, the Parent Bill of Rights. Uh, that was vetoed by the governor. It did have an override in the Senate, but it did not have an override in the House. So my understanding is that uh, bill is not moving forward this session. And then, of course, there's information on our district website. So that's where we're at right now uh, from Topeka. Any questions? Okay. The next agenda item is election of the Board of Education Vice President. So do you... Go ahead. I was going to say, do you want Anna to come up and, and let us know. Anna's our board clerk. Please. Let us know who has been nominated, because that you have a process in place. The nominees for Board of Education Vice President are Amy Tysling, Jody Dietz, and Tom Mitchell. I would like to pull my name off consideration. Are there any additions or deletions to this list of nominees? Tom has removed his name. I'd like to add Katie Bowers as the nominee. Okay, at your seat, there's a ballot. Please. I'd like to hold, I'd like to pull my name off as well. Okay. So the the two nominees are Jody Dietz and Katie Bowers. There's a, at your seat, there's a ballot form. Please fill out your name on the first line labeled board voter's name, the second line labeled board of education price, vice president nomination. Please write the name of your nomination for the role of vice, board of education vice president. The ballots will then be collected and read out loud and tallied. The nominee receiving the most ballot nominations will be the board of education vice president.
The clerk will then collect and read and report each ballot. Patrick Hurley for Katie Bowers. Jody Dietz for Jody Dietz. Tom Mitchell for Jody Dietz. Katie Bowers for Katie Bowers. Jim McMullen for Katie Bowers. Gina Knapp for Katie Bowers. Amy Tysling for Jody Deeds. Thank you very much. Uh, the new vice president is Katie Bowers. Congratulations. Um, do you need to take a break to give your son a call? Okay. The next agenda item is the Board of Education Communication Committee. The Communication Committee was um, something that we've discussed several times about the idea of um, having more interaction uh, with our um, public and how we can receive input and and, and have uh, additional communication with him. Christy, do you have any more you'd like to add to that? Okay. Anybody else have any uh, comments on that? Okay. Do I have a motion? I approve. Uh, sorry. I, uh, I move that the Board of Education um, approve the establishment of communication committee. Um, is that document entered into? It is not. Okay. I, I guess I would say in accordance with the document that we circulated and reviewed this morning in uh, the board workshop. And that's a, a board advisory committee? Board advisory committee. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second by Gina. Is there any discussion about that? Okay. Uh, all in favor, raise your right hand. Uh, all opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7-0. The next uh, agenda item is the... Is that the contract? Panorama. The panorama contract. Um, the panorama contract was on the consent agenda. It was brought off uh, for us to have an additional conversation uh, about that uh, contract. Uh, Jim, did you have any comments you wanted to make on that contract? Um, uh, sure. The the um, I would say that the, my main con I've got two main concerns around it. Um, and, and part of this is admittedly that I, I don't have a full I don't have a full grasp of what the district is doing social emotional learning um, but you know I've been said I've been kind of outspoken in the past it really my mind it really hasn't been changed that that the social emotional learning is a significant emphasis by our district and I understand some of it state, you know, guided uh, is inappropriate. And so that's my, num that's my number one objection. My number two objection is I don't I, d I don't know I, and I would like to understand better um, exactly how the data that is gathered is used. Um, I'd, and I'd like to ensure that you know, parents throughout the district really understand that that data is being collected and that the, the results of those um, surveys, um, you know, how they're being used and, and in the manner in which they're being used. So those are my, those are my concerns. I'm not saying I necessarily would, if I knew more, if I, if I feel like I was better educated about it, that I, uh, that I wouldn't support it, but at this point in time, I don't. And maybe, you know, and I doubt through this, maybe through this conversation, we. You know, we could, but that, that's why I asked to pull it off the agenda okay. or off the consent agenda. Any, any other comments, Katie? Um, 
dr collier really answered a lot of my questions today even if i just bounced any more back to her so i want to say i understand why we collect the data i know it's for um k s the, the kansas state requirements and so we're fulfilling a requirement there so i, I totally understand that piece um i do think that i mean and you have to opt in and i think the figures they gave us there wasn't a lot of people um, opting in but enough um, but I went back and looked at kind of the disclaimer and I don't think parents understand that there are um, unique identifiers so that your child could be potentially um, tied to that survey so that's a little concerning um, again I understand why we're doing it um, but I think we need to do the open transparency hey your your child's uh, ID number is tied to this study um, but I also think too that our district is um, capable of probably doing our own surveys as well instead of having to batch out to another person. And part of our requirement is that we do a research-based uh, approach and a survey that we put together ourselves would not be research-based. Okay. That's why that's a part of this. And the other thing I, I do want to reiterate what, you, what Katie said here, which was that you have to opt in Mm -hmm. So nobody would take this uh, unless they opt in. And this contract meets one of our the state requirements for accreditation, right? Um, and so with, without this, we could potentially face loss of accreditation, correct? Yeah. Um, any, any other um, questions, Jim? I have a question. Gina? How many years have we been doing Panorama? I'm sorry. Dr. Collier, thank you. It was piloted in 1819 in five schools, and then uh, uh, we moved it across the district in 1920. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Katie? When I went to the website, just looking at panorama, just Playing around with it at the bottom it says like join us for to find out how to get ESER funds or something is that something we're doing ESER, ESER sorry not ESER ESER are we pay, paying for it using ESER funds no I like do we use it to get ESER funds oh no so no. we okay. we get a certain amount of ESER funds from the state and we would have to allocate that for pan panorama would be an allowable expense for that mm -hmm. I don't know if we're using ESER funds or not Okay. okay. Any other questions? I move for approval of the panorama contract as presented in the consent agenda. Is there a second? A motion by Tom, second by Amy. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of approving the contract, raise your right hand. All opposed? Uh, motion passes 5-2. Do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Motion by Tom. Is there a second? Second by Jody. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, raise your right hand. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much.